Kim, what's on your radar? Well, I want to talk a little bit about uh, this new world order sort of that you actually, Ryan, talked about a little bit yesterday. But there has been a lot of talk in the uh, about the international community coming together against Russia, that Russia miscalculated and perhaps assumed Europe, which is so reliant on their oil and natural gas, that they wouldn't be reacting the way that they are. And now we're seeing Germany, France and even Switzerland, you know, big bad Switzerland coming out against Russia and backing various economic measures. But the international community is much larger than the U.S. and Europe. On Friday, the U.N. Security Council held a vote to condemn Russia. Three countries abstained, China, India, and the United Arab Emirates. Other countries have also hesitated or refused to condemn or punish Russia. And I want to go over some of these countries. So let's start with China. Now, in early February, China and Russia issued a written pact railing against NATO expansion and calling for a new multipolar world order. Say, stating in this in this document, friendship between the two states has no limits. There are no forbidden areas of cooperation. Xi also said that their joint strategy would have a far reaching influence on China, Russia and the world. The statement went on to say that Russia and China stand against attempts by external forces to undermine security and stability in their common adjacent regions, intend to counter interference by outside forces in the international affairs of sovereign countries under any pretext, oppose color revolutions, and will increase cooperation. So they've come together, Russia and China. They've said, our our partnership has no bounds. Uh, we're going to be partnering in many, many ways. This is going to have a large impact around the world. Not only is it a security cooperation, but it's also economic. Six days before Russia invaded Ukraine, Russia announced a years-long deal to sell 100 million tons of coal to China, a contract worth more than $20 billion. They're also going to be building pipelines to begin exporting their natural gas to China. Now, let's move on to India here. Despite being the world's largest democracy, India also abstained from condemning Russia. Russia is India's largest arms supplier, Russia has also backed India on U.S. security on U.N. Security Council resolutions over disputed Kashmir. India did call for an immediate cessation of violence. Like many of these countries are saying, oh, we don't like the violence, but uh, but then they don't condemn Russia. Modi called for efforts to return to diplomacy, saying the difference between Russia and the NATO group can only be resolved through honest and sincere dialogue. So even India. This is not a, uh, you know, this is a one of the, the world's largest democracies, and they've even abstained from condemning Russia. India and China alone, the two economies are massive, lots of people there. So if Europe and the West were to cut off Russia, they just need to turn south and they would be just fine. Now, the United Arab Emirates is also not taking sides. The Emirates views Russia as a close ally in conflicts such as Syria and Libya, two conflicts the U.S. has been on the opposite side of. And UAE buys weapons from Russia. They do a lot of trade with Russia. And it turns out Dubai is a hotspot for Russian tourism. So the UAE has also abstained from condemning Russia. Saudi Arabia is also uh, not condemning Russia. In fact, they're not on the UN Security Council, so they couldn't vote. But the Crown Prince came out saying that they're committed to the OPEC plus agreement with Russia. And this is probably the worst of all news for Biden in Europe, because basically uh, Saudi Arabia does not intend to increase oil production in order to drive down prices. And as Ryan mentioned yesterday, this is something that the Biden administration had asked of Saudi Arabia. This was even before the invasion of Ukraine. And Saudi Arabia said, no, we're not going to be pumping out more oil in order to reduce prices. And even after the invasion of Ukraine, knowing that uh, that the cost of oil is skyrocketing, Saudi Arabia has still come out saying, nah, we still have our deals with OPEC plus and we're going to maintain those. So this means as prices skyrocket, Russia makes more money, actually. Uh, this allows them to better weather these economic sanctions that they're being hit with. But it also means inflation continues. So why would Saudi Arabia side with Russia? Well, they're sick of being snubbed by the U.S., as Ryan also mentioned in his radar yesterday. Obama wouldn't meet with the crown prince. Biden has refused to meet with the crown prince. Um, Putin has been openly friendly to the crown prince, even after Jamal Khashoggi was murdered. We all know that infamous photograph of Putin and the crown prince giving each other a high five. Uh, so they're friendly with one another and they have a strong security alliance. They have a strong friendship. And that is something that the United States sort of pushed Saudi Arabia towards Russia by snubbing Saudi Arabia. We also pushed Russia towards China. We might actually live to regret that in a few years when we realize the damage that that's done by turning on Russia and continuing to propagate Russiagate. Uh, Russia has turned itself towards China and 
uh, probably to their benefit. Another one, another uh, international player that has abstained, at least originally from adding their name to the list of countries officially condemning Russia is Israel. Now, when you can't get Israel on your side when you're in the United States, you know you've got a problem. But they've since said that they will add their name, but it's still really kind of unclear what's going on there. But why the flip-flop? People are wanting to know, what's up with Israel? What's up with this flip-flop? Well, Russia, uh, Israel sees Russia as a strategic ally, keeping Iran in check in Syria. So they see them as a strategic uh, in, foreign policy partner at the moment in the Middle East. Also, there's something else going on here that... Uh, definitely needs to be mentioned. And that is for many Israelis, they actually really like Putin. There's billboards of Putin in Israel. He's a fairly popular figure there. And it's because he represents the Red Army that crushed the Nazis in World War II. And on the flip side, Ukrainians actually stir some uh, very negative memories for the Jewish people in Israel. Uh, Many Jews, in fact, a million were murdered in the Ukraine by the Nazis and by Ukrainians. Uh, So they were slaughtered and they remember this. So they're feeling this sort of nostalgia towards Putin, not, of course, saying we don't like the violence. Everybody's saying this collectively. But at the same time, they've been very slow, really hesitant and unwilling to even go against Russia on this. Now, the economic sanctions are going to be hurting Russia, but they've been hit with sanctions and Others, they've seen others hit with sanctions. So they have prepared for this. And this is kind of one of those things where the United States and the West in our posturing, in our economic sanctions of Russia, um, in our going after them, we sort of have this attitude of we're too big to fail. And the reality is these countries have sort of figured out the game plan by now. We've been overusing sanctions and countries have been able to prepare. So for example, Russia has vastly increased their domestic production of food and domestic production of their own medicine. Um, They've been preparing for the day that the United States would come after them. China has been doing the same thing and so so have many other nations. Now the ruble did take a 30% hit yesterday, but Russia's central bank immediately more than doubled its interest rate to heat off the inflation. So meanwhile, price of energy is just going to come at a premium, driving us into a recession. Our economic sanctions against Russia are likely going to backfire. We already have out of control inflation. That's going to drive us into a recession. The central bank then raising interest rates is only going to make it worse. So there's actually a real possibility that we're hurting ourselves more than we're hurting Russia. The economic sanctions, like I mentioned, will hurt Russia, but They've insulated themselves quite a bit. It's not going to kill them. They've seen what's happened in Iran. Iran, uh, they've been able to, believe it or not, weather the economic sanctions storm, and Russia's in a better position than Iran to do this. So Russia and China, amongst many others, are looking to replace the U.S. dollar as the world currency. This is a no-brainer. This is obviously what's happening. And if not replace it, at least add another robust option or two, which is what they mention in their in their the statement that they put out saying that they're looking to create a multipolar global world order. And this is looking more and more likely. Now, a lot of people say, no way, there's no way that the dollar is going to be replaced because of the advantages. And uh, the U.S. dollar has had many advantages that has made it the world currency. But those advantages are fading. Limited inflation and depreciation was one of the reasons why the world likes to use the dollar. But that is no longer the case. I mean, inflation right now is no longer limited, nor is it transitory. Uh, The economy, our, our economy is very large. That was one of the other reasons why the world liked to use the U.S. dollar. But China's got a large economy also. Uh, and of course, we do have a, a open market, and that is one of the reasons why the dollar is still being used. But again, it does look like things are potentially flipping. So Ryan and Robbie, you know, the big thing about this is uh, this, the, for one, thinking that the world is coming out against China, I mean, against Russia is not the case, right? There is a greater world than just Europe going on here. And they're opening up their doors and saying, we're not we're not cutting off Russia or China for business. And it's almost like they're seeing the new kid on the block and they're saying, you know, you guys are kind of old news now. And we want to see what these guys are going to do, because we think they're going to be doing something uh, bigger and they're going to be insulated. I mean, China in the pandemic was the only economy that actually grew, uh, which uh, you know raises some suspicions, I think, in a lot of in a lot of ways with everything that's going on. But. I think we're putting ourselves in a really bad position thinking that we are too big to fail, thinking that 
we could just do whatever we want, especially with these economic sanctions and try to crush their economy. They're just going to create another economy, a secondary economy, and that economy is going to grow. So I don't know what the game plan is here, but it doesn't outlook not so good. That's kind of my overall <laughs> looking at this. Yeah, it's pessimistic. Um, I, I think the, but the plan is not, the, the point of the sanctions, right, is just to deliver enough, I mean, I said this a couple times today, but to deliver enough short-term pain to just get them to cease the invasion. I, like, I agree long-term, and maybe it won't work, and, and lo like long-term it is not, I, 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 it would not be worth doing. I, I, I'm not generally very favorable towards sanctions. I, I agree with you. I think they've been over overused. I don't think there's a, a good track record of sanctions leading to the kind of internal regime change that we like imagine they will. So I, I do agree with you. But I, this is kind of a this is kind of an exceptional case. It's a very exceptional case because Russia is just invading a country and we don't want them to do that and we can't attack them because it will cause a nuclear war. So we're just like looking Although, for other things to do. This uh, just a few hours ago, Medvedev actually came out saying, "If these economic sanctions, you're looking for war." Uh, pointed at at France when France. Well, came I mean, out who and cares? Said, they're looking for war, right? They invaded another country. <laughs> they're they're, 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 do, they they're doing it. war. They like. They well, can't I, say, oh, I, I don't how dare think... you do something like you're the ones who should yeah. not be doing the thing you're doing. Sure, but I don't think I I don't think it's wise to be looking for nuclear war. Right. No, and I have, I've, I've been making this point, too, that I do think we have to be more careful than we're being with, yeah. with, the, with the economic warfare that's, that's being waged. Even the rhetoric around it from some of the NATO countries is, you know, we're not going to go to war against them, but we are going to choke their economy to death. It's like, whoa, OK, well, I, I don't know if necessarily that is going to accomplish what your objective is, because what you're saying is, you don't want to escalate beyond a certain point because you think it'll lead to nuclear war. But what if the thing that you're doing is that is that escalation? Uh, then you, then you need to rethink that. But I think you're, I think what you're pointing to is 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 very interesting. This this realignment that we're witnessing I think is being accelerated by this war, and it's an open question what this means. The 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 decision by India of which direction they go, I think will be very telling because. You know, you could superficially say that, well, this is dem these are democracies versus authoritarian countries. But then you'd say, well, what about India? India is the biggest democracy in the world. And it, and it, it exposes that there's something richer and more nuanced going on because this isn't just a, a realignment that's going on, you know, outside, you know, country against country and countries allying with each other. Inside of individual countries, this realignment is, is taking place and it kind of pits a sort of liberal, cosmopolitan, center-left kind of uh, democratic order against a more kind of right-wing populist slash authoritarian order. And so that would help to explain why, say, you do have elements, like, say, in the U.S. that are awfully sympathetic, uh, you know, two movements that are, that are associated with, say, Putin. Or in India, you have Modi, who is this kind of right-wing nationalist slash uh, populist who is right. you know suppressing a lot of the kind of democratic norms that that India had been developing since the since the 1950s creating kind of an ethno populism there and so that would help explain why in a country that you might say well that's the biggest democracy in the world why why would they be kind of drawn into the orbit uh, well it's yeah. not that's not that all of them are but it certainly Modi would be born, would be drawn in, into that orbit so, I mean, it's what well, we're watching it unfold in real time. So it's don't very you think hard Putin to... is really damaging? I agree with you that there are certain aspects of the kind of populist new right in America that are a lot more favorable or have been more favorable toward Russia, toward Putin, uh, than obviously than the cons you know conservatives of a generation before that, the neoconservative right. movement. But I, I, in response to this, I've seen mostly, maybe not universally, but mostly strong condemnation, even from more Russia soft elements on right. the right. So I, we'll Putin see. is doing yeah. himself a lot of, now maybe he doesn't care, maybe it doesn't matter, but he is doing himself a lot of reputational harm yes. among, I think among that's right. everyone in the West. Not Nick, Kim's right to point out that the West isn't the whole world, right. but, uh, but certainly Not in the even West. close. I mean, yeah. look, China and India alone have all the population, right? I mean, right. they don't need, once you've got them on your side, you don't need to be worrying about 
the economic ramifications coming from the United States or Europe, especially if you're thinking you're going to be replacing the U.S. dollar. And the more I look into this and the more I was kind of seeing these, the reaction from the rest of the international community uh, with India, you know, the ones I've just mentioned, I, I, I don't think this is, at, I mean, I do think this is about NATO expansion. I do think that that's really upset Putin. I also think this was very planned. And I think we are being very short-sighted thinking that this is just a Ukraine issue. I don't think this is about Ukraine. I think this is about American hegemony. And the, and the more we understand this, that that is what they're really taking on, that we're already in World War III, we just don't realize it. Uh, hopefully it doesn't escalate to a nuclear war. But at this point, they're taking us on that statement. If you read the whole statement that was put out by China and Russia at the like February 4th, it is ominous. I mean, they're basically saying your days are numbered, guys. It's over. Yeah. And they're and then, you know, they, they do this. They then forge all of these economic uh, partnerships to one another. And and then suddenly Russia goes in and invades Ukraine as if they were going to have a NATO vote tomorrow to bring them in. They weren't. There was nothing really, truly that imminent about it. Why did it happen? Because I think these guys planned this out and thought this through. And I think the U.S. dollar has been replaced. We just don't realize it yet. And it, it, it's, it's going to be well, happening a lot sooner than later. Their big That's problem, when we will realize yeah, it. Yeah, their, their big problem is that they don't yet have something to replace it with. And... You know, the kind of oligarch slash global capitalist class doesn't have faith in these countries' ability to create a stable currency that can rival the dollar. That's the only thing at this point that continues to make I the dollar so anymore. dominant. But what is yeah, like, I that's think the, I, like because China was the only one that actually survived the pandemic. So I think everybody's looking at China now and saying, well, actually, they're more stable. And we might, you know, they're, of course, we could say, well, no, their, bur their bubble's going to burst and all this. But people are looking at the United States saying the same thing. We've got runaway inflation. We can't even control it. And now when Russia starts to turn off the pipes. Well, we, uh, but in, and mean, then, no, and all an they have to do, by yeah. the way, all they have to do is say, we're turning off the pipes. We'll turn them back on. But guess what? You have to pay us in gold, you know, gold back. Uh, rubles and yeah, you, you want right. So if it if it were that simple, they would have done it by now. I do think you're right that we're waning. We're you know we're 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 in decline and we're moving towards this this new era. Yeah. Uh, but inflation is global, and so inflation alone in the United States is not something that investors and and the people who make these decisions about what the reserve currency will be that that's not going to be the thing that's going to keep them away from the dollar and moving over to China. It's that you look they look at China. Like, yeah, I don't know. That's I don't that's I don't quite yeah. trust the numbers that I'm reading there. I don't I don't I don't trust that if I put my money in that I'm going to be able to get it, get it back out. And that is still the thing that the United States yeah. economy has for it. Well, we've got to leave it Until there. Thank yeah. you, Kim. <laughs> uh, we'll be back with more rising right after this.